Hello, welcome. Uh, this is Brace for Impact, or uh, the alternate title, You'll Never Believe What Happened, a Hell Dive into Live Service on Hell Divers 2. So let's start with introductions. Who the hell am I? I'm Ian McEachern. Been in the industry for about five years now, working alternately as a programmer, team lead, and now a producer. Uh, before joining Arrowhead, I worked on Dead by Daylight for a couple of years. I've been at Arrowhead for about two years now, uh, and I'm currently working as a producer for engine, backend, and tools on Helldivers 2. So this should give you an idea of the kind of things I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation. Uh, a lot of tech stuff, a lot of production stuff. Uh, hopefully that doesn't scare you off. Uh, after all, you know, games is very much an interdisciplinary medium, and I think there's a lot of benefit to understanding how everything fits together holistically. So. Hopefully, there's something in here for everyone. What's Helldivers? Uh, you might have heard of us if you're in this room. I figure you probably have. The most important part for the talk today is it's a live service game. So that's really what, uh, what we're going to be focusing on is sort of the unique challenges, uh, questions you need to ask if you are developing a live service title. It's also worth noting it's unlike anything Arrowhead has ever made before. Uh, all our previous titles, uh, most of these were top-down shooters. Uh, none of them were live service games. All of them you know, had a very traditional uh, publishing model, uh, the initial release, and then a couple of DLCs at some indeterminate time in the future. So this was really a big shift for us. A lot of things we had to learn how to do differently in order to adjust to uh, building, you know, tackling the unique beast of a live service game. Uh, it was also, yeah, it's, it's a big challenge to make that shift. So if you are in a situation where you're thinking of doing something similarly, whether shifting to live service or something else that you haven't done before, really, you know, take your time, do your research, make sure, sure you know what you are getting yourself into. So if you find yourself making a live service game, uh, this is the talk for you, I guess. When we were preparing for launch, we went through and asked ourselves a ton of questions. And these are some of them, I think these are kind of the big ones that uh, you should be asking yourself and you should have answers for. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the answers that we came up for, but I want to stress that what we did is not the only way you can do this. Um, we came up with answers, they're probably are better answers to a lot of these questions out there. So, you know, hopefully learn some lessons from me, but take it from there and run with it. So the questions we're going to primarily be going over today are, uh, what are data, mi data miners going to find, and do you care? Uh, is your release branch clean and stable? What's the schedule? Uh, what is your planned release cadence? Can you avoid regressions? And what are you going to do if you can't? Uh, what's your bus factor? If anyone's not familiar with bus factor, uh, that is what happens if someone on the team gets hit by a bus tomorrow. Can we keep going? The other way it's uh, phrased would be siloing, you'll hear people talk about. Uh, these next two questions are sort of back end. Is your back end infrastructure efficient? And can it scale? And finally, uh, this question, I'm not really going to go into the, uh, in this talk, but I do want to mention it anyways, is, is your monetization ethical? I think it's a really important question to ask for a live service game. I think most or all of us can think of some examples of predatory monetization we've seen. And we work in games. Like, we should be building products that make people's lives better. Uh, and I think when you are building monetization or any system, you should ask yourself, how many lives could this ruin? And the only acceptable answer to that question is it's going to ruin zero lives. So that's an important thing, I think, to consider, uh, especially, again, in a live service context. So let's start going down the list. For keeping your release branch clean, we came up with two possible solutions to this uh, that we discussed internally. The first was modular development. And the second was using branches or streams if you're from working with Perforce. Uh, there are probably other solutions. Uh, if you know of any, please let me know, because I'm really curious to hear some new approaches to this. The first one we considered uh, was a modular approach to development. 
Um, we started considering this, I think, about five, six years into development, though. Uh, it was around the time I joined the company that we started talking about it. And the challenge for this is it is a very technically heavy, technically complex solution that is really only viable if you start developing your game this way from the beginning. So the way this works is you have sort of the core functionality of your game, which is uh, the only part that is guaranteed to be present. Everything else is a separate module that you can plug and play with the core game, but you can also just as easily remove it. This is kind of like a microservices approach, if anyone is familiar with that uh, technical paradigm. So in this example, yeah, you have the core game, then say you might want to add weapons to your game, so you develop a weapons module. And then that has separate modules for each you know, weapon or group of weapons, depending on how you want to package it. But again, the system, the core system can work with or without those additional modules, no problem. In the end, though, we didn't go with this because of the challenges that I mentioned. Um, this was how our branches were structured when I joined the company. We functionally had a single main branch where all development was occurring. We would create separate branches for you know, random things as we were developing them, but uh, they would only really be short-lived. So you would create the branch, do some work, merge it back into main, and that was where everything was. This is fine if you're doing uh, traditional game development, but for live service, you need to uh, optimize for an environment where you can release something you know, on a fairly frequent scale. In our case, four to six weeks, every four to six weeks. But you're not going to be developing everything within that four to six week period. You know, we're working on stuff that we have planned for December, further in the future right now and we're going to be releasing several things in the time between now and then. So in order to keep that main branch clean, if you were working in a system like this, you would need to have you know, thing and stuff living off on their own for a very long period of time. And if those two things happen to be touching the same system, when you try to reconcile that by bringing it into main, you are going to have a lot of problems. So this is not really like a good system for working uh, if you were in a live service environment. So this is what we ended up with, where you have you know, release A has its own branch, release B has its own branch, and so on down the line. The content in release A, every time someone commits something to that branch, it gets automatically brought down to B, but never goes back up the stream. So this gives us a dedicated main branch where everyone can work that has all the content for a given release uh, in order to make sure we have clean content for each release without any additional work, without needing to go back and like manually pull stuff out without that worry of massive conflicts. Um, there are still some things you need to make this work. You need a technical system that is capable of merging every commit down the line. Um, and you also need someone who is going to keep an eye on it because conflicts are still gonna happen and you need those conflicts resolved as quickly as possible so that you know, the person working on branch E doesn't need to wait a couple weeks for uh, the content from branch A to make it down there and blow up their whole system. The one other thing you need to consider is for this system to work, is, as in the previous diagram, you need to know exactly what is going to be in every branch uh, from the moment you start developing on it. And that's not always realistic or possible. You know, sometimes you're working on something, it's somewhat experimental, you're not sure how long it's gonna take. For situations like this, you still need to have those separate uh, branches off of, say, branch B, where you say, I think this is gonna be in branch B, I'm not sure, let's just create a branch for now. This way the content is still separate, we can move it to branch C relatively easily in this system. In order for this to work, you need to make sure people feel safe and comfortable. You really need to foster a, a culture where people can say, I'm not sure if this feature is gonna be ready on time, let's keep it separate for now. Uh, it's worth also noting this does create a bit more overhead for QA where they need to you know, have an awareness of this branch, but it is nowhere near the chaos of that initial system where you just have the single main and every feature is living off in its own branch. 
All right, a release cadence. As a producer, it's a spreadsheet. This is what I get really excited about. Uh, this was the initial plan that we had. Uh, across the top, this is weeks from release. Uh, and each patch, you know, uh, branch A, branch B, branch C, uh, is separated by about six weeks. Um, this was kind of our first draft of it, but as we got closer to release, um, we got a little bit nervous about how players were going to respond, you know. It's easy to look back and say, it's going to be fine, but at the time, we were concerned about whether or not the game was going to succeed and wanted to make sure we provided lots of new stuff to keep players engaged, keep players interested. So this was the schedule that we uh, moved to shortly before launch. You will notice this is much more aggressive than the previous schedule. Um, it was also not the schedule that we had practiced with. Uh, we had adopted this schedule uh, here about, I'm gonna say, eight months before we went live and started practicing this uh, with our milestone deliveries to Sony. So, you know, we would go through content lock. We would have a bug fixing deadline and then we would ship the build. The one part we didn't do is go through the hot fixing period after we shipped a milestone uh, build to Sony. In hindsight, I really wish we had done that because that was a part of the process that when we went live, we hadn't practiced and I think is part of the reason we ended up thinking we could accomplish this, not having any time for those potential hot fixes and bug fixes after uh, we, we initially launched. We'll come back to this a bit later, though. For now, let's talk about avoiding regressions. Um, there are a couple of ways you can do this. One of the big ones that I would recommend, again, specifically in a live service context, is automated testing. You know, Sony very generously provided us some QA engineering support to help build uh, automated tests. This is something I kind of wish we had invested more of our internal attention and support to uh, in order to more fully you know, flesh those out, have something more solid as a foundation. Um, it's always a balancing act for building these. They take a lot of work. And you know, there is an opportunity cost in terms of development time spent building testing versus building the actual game. Because we work in an iterative medium, I, I hope, most of us, uh, there is also the risk that you build a test for something and then change it, and so you have to update the test. So it's really good to uh, make sure you focus on things that are relatively stable. So if you're building a game like Helldivers 2, you can be pretty sure you're going to have weapons, you're going to have a character that moves around, you're going to have enemies. Like, these are things that, with a little bit of work, you can build automated tests pretty early to make sure these things are at least not crashing the game. And with a little bit more support in terms of telemetry, uh, a couple tools in the engine, you can get some really robust data about, hey, is this weapon dealing the right damage? Is it applying status effects correctly? Um, these are really good things to have when you are going to be constantly updating the game and shipping out patches to players. It's also important to ask, uh, what are the systems that it is harder for humans to test? Uh, if you have a weapon and it kills a particular enemy in 27 bullets, that is a hard thing for a QA tester to really evaluate accurately. But it's really easy for a computer to do it. So those are the kinds of things that you should focus your automated testing efforts. Uh, it will get you better coverage, and also it will make life better for QA because they don't have to sit there and go, okay, one shot, two shot, three shot, over and over again for however many different weapons and different enemies you have. Um, that being said, automated testing is not a silver bullet for everything. Computers are terrible at figuring out if for example, you know, a mesh looks good or a skeleton is correct. Those things can be very obviously deformed to human eyes and a computer will, have a, will not be able, as far as I'm aware, will not be able to actually figure that out and identify that. So definitely pick your targets here. That being said, no matter how much work you do to avoid regressions, they're still going to happen sometimes. And this is why it's important to uh, have a kill switch. If you're working on a live service game, you have a back end. If you have a back end, you should use it. And one of the things you should use it for is having a way to turn off non-essential features so that the core game can keep running. Um, 
we unfortunately did not have this pre-launch, but, uh, well, we had it for a handful of features, but we did not have it for as much stuff as I wish we had had it for. Um, so you should use it for, yeah, any individual, like all your individual weapons should be able to toggle them on and off. Any enemy, you should be able to turn on and off. Uh, if you want to get really fancy with this, you can also have the back end support uh, data balancing. So how much damage a weapon does, how much HP an enemy has, control that stuff from the back end. This, again, is a system that it's going to be easier to build if you build it that way from the start. It is much harder if you have all these systems in your game client code, tightly interconnected, and you need to start unpacking them one by one in order to start controlling them from the back end. So like with a lot of stuff in this presentation, apologies for repeating it again and again, plan it early. It will make your life easier down the line. Uh, the last thing, yeah, I think I've covered that. Uh, on to silos and bus factor. Take this as a hypothetical team. You've got three people, and the circles represent uh, the overlap in the work that they are doing, the knowledge that they have. If Jesse gets hit by a bus, can we still get things done with an overlap like this? Yeah, probably. But if you have something like this, you're in trouble. Uh, this, again, super important for live service. So what are some solutions to make sure you have a robust team that can survive shocks? Uh, one of the recommendations I have, code reviews. Uh, like code reviews, pair programming, these are sort of programmer focused, again, because of my background, but these can apply for anything. You can do art reviews. If you are doing art, chances are somehow you are plugging that into the game. Have someone look over how that is working. Uh, not only is it good for making sure you don't make mistakes, you catch a lot of them with systems like these, uh, it's great for sharing knowledge. So even if someone has not done the work, at least they have looked at the output of the work and are better situated to be able to fill in if they need to. Another good system is pair programming. We don't do a ton of that at Arrowhead, but uh, we do still do it for some difficult problems. You know, make sure we get people to uh, sit down together and for onboarding people to introduce them to our systems. Don't, uh, make sure you don't have a single feature owner. It is very easy to fall into a situation where, especially for tasks that aren't particularly fun, where one person does it and then they quickly become the expert and they are the person that will be asked to do that going forward. So be really careful, watch out for that situation happening. If you do see it happening, try to make sure there is a deputy, someone else who can help out if that person goes on vacation or gets sick or whatever. Also, uh, avoid fiefdoms. We are making games, it's exciting. We get excited, we get attached to our features sometimes, and sometimes we don't want other people to get involved, but this is a problem for working in a team, which most of us are, and that's something that we need to keep in mind and remind others that, hey, this is a team, we all need to be able to understand what is happening on this game and be able to uh, work on it if push comes to shove. Documentation is one that can be helpful, but it can also be harmful. The only thing worse than no documentation is bad documentation. So if you are going to invest in documentation, make sure you keep it up to date. Uh, do your best to keep it clear, concise, and well organized. If you can hire a technical writer, do it. If you can hire a technical uh, writing architect, even better. I will, you know, a lot of these suggestions work best on mid-size and larger teams, I, I will admit, but uh, a lot of them work great if you have two people in a room, code reviews being a prime example. So try to keep it in mind no matter what your team size is. Again, avoiding, uh, bus, avoiding silos is important on any project, but it is absolutely critical on a live service game because you are going to have a frequent release cadence, you are going to have player expectations, and you need to have a team that is robust enough to meet those. All right, back end infrastructure. Let's talk about the one that made the news. Uh, load test it. Load test it, and no matter what estimates you have for how much load you are going to need, go past that if you can load test well beyond what the uh, expectations are for your specific title. Also, try to avoid monoliths. Having separate uh, 
purpose-specific databases is a lot easier to manage than if you have one monolithic database. It also makes the system a lot more robust. You can build it in such a way that if one system fails, not everything falls over. Also, you know, again, working in a live service game, you're probably going to be working with a lot of sensitive player information. You know, purchase transactions, what uh, player inventories. These are things that you absolutely need to have a backup for. Uh, I'll also mention unit tests. This is a thing that is much harder to build for the clients. Like, I didn't even talk about that for automated testing. Uh, unit testing is really, really hard with an iterative game design. Uh, but for the back end, this is much more sort of traditional uh, software engineering, and unit tests are absolutely something you should have. Also, documentation. Again, a slight difference from documentation for uh, work happening in the game client. In the back end, uh, you're going to be building an API. You should have clear, easily available documentation on that API, so whenever people need to interface with the back end, they can figure out exactly what functions are available to them and exactly what those functions do. Should also ask yourself, what is the risk of human error? It's very easy to have systems in a backend where people can just go in and change a value, but there can be serious consequences to doing that. If you find yourself in a situation where, oh, hey, we added a button to delete all player data because it was making testing easier, at least, I mean, first of all, ask yourself why you have that button to begin with, but second of all, at least have a pop-up that says, are you sure you want to delete all player data? So we've done all this preparation. We're ready to go, right? Right? Brace for impact. So launch. Our concurrent user estimates were off by almost an order of magnitude. We thought we would have less than 150,000 players. That was the most optimistic projection we received. But we actually peaked at 750,000. So, that's a lot. Uh, it's also important to remember that in a live environment, there will be bugs. There are always things that you do not anticipate, things that you look at and think, what are the chances anyone's going to encounter that? And then next thing you know, hundreds or thousands of people are encountering that bug. Also, if you're releasing a PC game, PC hardware has almost infinite variety, uh, especially in you know, the Internet of Things era. People are going to try and play your game on a toaster, and you are going to get crash reports from that. Uh, our planning almost immediately went out the window when we had launch. Uh, so if you are planning to launch a live service game, add more buffer time to your schedule. Now add some more buffer time to your schedule. You can thank me later. Uh, when we actually went live on launch day, half the studio was having a party while the other half was trying to keep the game running. So you remember this? Spreadsheets, my favorite thing. This was our plan, and this is what it actually looked like. <laughs> it's also important to note that we're no longer measuring weeks across that top, that's days. This is a slight exaggeration, but only very slight. In the first 18 days after launch, we patched the game 12 times. This is not aspirational. This is not a goal. Uh, the only way we managed to pull this off is we pulled basically every programmer in the company into a strike team whose entire goal was to look at what issues the game was having and figuring out how to fix those so they could get another patch out the door. This team did fantastic work and made a huge difference in the reception of the game. But by the end of February, everyone was exhausted. And this also had an impact on people who weren't actively involved in this strike team because they could see the stress that this was putting on those people and I think also felt, felt helpless to step in and fix these critical issues. Of course, this also had an impact on the rest of our content plans. We had to push things out, but we had some things we thought we couldn't move. The big one was uh, War Bonds, which is like our version of a battle pass, where we had communicated to players that we were going to release one of these every four weeks, or I guess once a month, and we felt that there was no way we could possibly move that date. We have now moved that to uh, every six weeks, 
so that it aligns with our actual release cadence, and it's been fine. So it's something that I really wish we had thought about earlier and taken the risk to make you know, working on things better for everyone. Anyways, at the end of February, the team was dissolved. Everyone was given an extra day off at the end of the month. Plus, we made sure everyone could take comp time for any overtime they worked. And now we've started to settle into a healthier routine. I want to stress, this is one that uh, does not apply just to live service games, but it's important to never forget the people. When people go above and beyond, make sure you acknowledge them, make sure you reward them, and make sure you give them time to rest. We are not machines. We do our best work when we are well rested, when we have good work-life balance. Also, when things go wrong, when overtime is you know, requested or required, it's important to understand that that is a failure, and that is something that you need to work hard to make sure you can avoid going forward. Figure out what went wrong, and figure out how to avoid it in the future. The last thing I'll say on this is a company is never more than the people who work there. And that's something that I think we all need to keep in mind all the time. For context, uh, these two images, the first is uh, a letter from our former CEO, now Chief Creative Officer, Johan Pilested. This was on launch day where uh, he said, this is not, we're not setting a precedent. And I said, can I get that in writing? So this is a guarantee that you know, these are exceptional circumstances and this is not going to become the new normal. We are not going to be patching every day indefinitely. And the second is a medal that was given out to everyone who works as part of that uh, post-release rapid patching. So content delays. There is always a push and pull between getting new exciting content out to players and taking our time to make sure we do it right. Uh, this is natural, you know, we're all very excited about the things that we are working on and want players to get out to be able to experience that stuff. But I think in our case, after launch, we pushed too hard. Uh, we were just too eager to get stuff out and it ended up leading to a lot of bugs pushed out to players, unfortunately. So now we're kind of taking our time. Maybe we are overcorrecting a bit too much in the, uh, the other direction, it's always going to be a balance. You always need to strike a balance and come to a compromise internally in the studio that everyone can get on board with. Uh, on sort of the opposite side of this, you're probably never gonna fix all the bugs. If you are in a live service environment where you are continually patching the game, you're gonna run into bugs, it's inevitable. You need to figure out what is an acceptable level for, for players and for us. Uh, as a final thought, if a feature isn't ready, don't be afraid to push it. Make sure people feel safe saying, I don't think my feature is going to be ready in time, and then saying, okay, where will we put it instead? This goes back to that, you know, the branching system, A, B, C, D, and having that safe, separate content. But even if a content is already integrated into a branch, like the B branch in that example, don't be afraid to push it if you have to. It's better than pushing out something that is not ready for prime time. For our release cadence, the adjustments we made post-launch, um, it's important to have a plan. As a producer, of course, I'm going to say that. But you also need to know when to be flexible. Uh, and as part of that flexibility, it's important to plan for contingencies. This goes back to me wishing we had done uh, practiced hot fixing our milestone builds that we shipped to Sony. You know, we went through most of that process, but we didn't practice collecting information from Sony about bugs and going through the triage process and then preparing a hot fix build that even if we weren't sending that to Sony, would have at least gotten us used to that process and that cadence. Um, it also would have given us some ideas about what are the things we should look for. So now we have uh, first of all, we've added a Thursday hotfix uh, right after we release a build. So it's, a, it's an optional thing. We hope we don't have to use it, but it is on the calendar so people know that that option is available to them. We also have certain criteria that we evaluate a live build uh, on to determine is this emergency hotfix necessary or can we just leave it and wait for the uh, lower pressure bug fix that we already have scheduled for the following week. 
Uh, it's also worth noting that you know, technology can be a limiting factor in what we ship, but it shouldn't be your only limiting factor. Just because something is technically possible doesn't mean you should do it. This is the lesson of Jurassic Park. It's a great movie. Watch it. Learn it well. And once more with feeling, add more buffer time to your schedule. There was a joke I heard recently. Uh, if you don't have 30 minutes to meditate, spend an hour meditating. If you don't have the production equivalent of that is if you can't add an hour of buffer time to your schedule, add, or if you can't add a week of buffer time to your schedule, add two weeks. And of course, there are two ways you can do this. You can either find more time, which good luck, or you can reduce the scope of your project. This one speaks for itself. So we encountered some system failures. Again, we were expecting 150,000 concurrent players, but we got up to 750,000. So our load testing was not quite sufficient. Uh, we had to scramble to get those numbers up, but thankfully, the fundamentals of our infrastructure were solid enough that we could. I do also wonder, this is kind of an aside, but it's a thing I think about all the time, is did the soft failures that our backend have actually end up helping us? Once we had hit, that initial level of success where our backend started to struggle, it felt like things started to snowball, where suddenly people were writing news stories about this super popular game that was so popular the servers couldn't handle stuff. And I do wonder, did that help us or hurt us in the long run? Did, were people seeing these stories and thinking, hey, that game's super popular, maybe I should check it out? I don't really have a takeaway for this, but it is something I think about constantly in terms of how lucky we got, frankly. You know, things worked out in ways that I didn't expect, and I wonder if some of our soft failures actually ended up contributing to our success in the end. It's important to note, though, that not everything failed in our back end. Our system, first of all, far surpassed our load testing even though we did still eventually hit limits. Um, we had spent time investing in zero downtime, de down, ugh, zero downtime deployments, that's a mouthful, which allowed us to patch the back end constantly without taking everything offline for players. We'd also invested in a lot of monitoring tools so we could see when things went wrong, sometimes even before it affected players. But more importantly, we could really do a deep dive and investigate uh, whenever, things, whenever something did go wrong. Despite everything, all the challenges that we had, all the, the news articles written about our struggling back end, the game has never actually been completely down ever since launch. We had to set a cap on players, but the players below that cap could always keep playing. And I think, I mean, that's definitely a big difference. If we had found ourselves in a situation where we had had to take, you know, six hour downtime in the first couple of days, I think our story could have turned out a lot differently. So maybe this is a more accurate picture of our back-end team. A bunch of people sitting quietly at computers, calmly monitoring the situation, and dealing with crises as they came up. One final note on back-end systems. It wasn't only our systems that uh, were not ready for the load of players playing our game. Uh, some of our partners, well, none of our partners expected this, and some of them were not fully prepared. Thankfully, we had contact information to quickly get in touch and get these uh, get issues resolved as they came up. So if you're launching a live service game, make sure who in your third-party software providers, uh, third-party service providers, who to reach out to in case of emergency. Make sure they're going to have someone available to answer your emails during your launch window. Uh, these are important things, critical things to take into consideration. Uh, we also had a back-end kill switch for one feature. Uh, you might be familiar with this one, the PSN account linking. This was actually mandatory for a little while, right after launch, but Sony, along with everyone else, was not prepared for the massive influx of players, so that server started to struggle, and we actually had to kill switch that, uh, that feature. In terms of the longer story on that, I could do a whole hour long talk on that, so we'll save that for later. For data mining and leaks, um, 
Preventing leaks can become all-consuming. No one really thought about this or did any work on this uh, aside from implementing the branching structure before we launched. But once we launched and we saw data miners pulling you know, half-finished work or upcoming work out of our builds, uh, people got, you know, we, we didn't like it. We don't like people ruining the surprise that we prepared for them. But that being said, you really need to consider the cost of the leaks and the cost of avoiding them. Because there is a development cost there and an opportunity cost, because those developers could be working on something else instead. It's also, you know, this is an arms race situation where you figure out one way to stop the data miners and they figure out a way to get around it. So it's always an escalating situation that is going to require constant work if you want to, you know, stamp it out completely. And, and I don't think you can stamp it out completely. So my approach is very much, if players want to spoil Christmas, if they want to go peek at the presents before Christmas Day arrives, let them. The exception to this is if it is affecting the experience for other players, people who have not opted in to, to spoiling Christmas. Uh, we had an example of this where some hackers figured out ways to spawn in incomplete content into the game, which had a negative impact on the play experience for players uh, outside of their control. So that is something that you know, was definitely worth spending the effort to prevent going forward. So this is after the impact, where by working together, somehow, miraculously, we came out the other side intact. This is what you call an accidental feature, by the way. So what are we doing now? Uh, we're continuing to work on improving our backend infrastructure for one. This includes a lot of new features so uh, that we can support an even higher peak concurrent user count in the future. So that we can support uh, new and returning players when we start releasing exciting new content. Things like, uh, and, and who can forget Oh, uh, that's already out, but just in case. So we're doubling down on investing in more complete solutions to all the problems I've mentioned so far. Uh, our back-end kill switch is already touching more systems than ever, and we're working to expand that, uh, as well as uh, adding you know, back-end data management so our game designers can tweak values on the fly. Uh, we are scaling up our automated testing. Our release cadence is finally starting to stabilize. Uh, I will mention, always launch on a Tuesday. Do not launch on a Thursday. You will not have time in the rest of the week to fix bugs, and as I've mentioned, there will be bugs. We're also growing our team to reduce our bus factor. We're not there yet, but we're getting better all the time. In an earlier version of this talk, uh, someone asked, if you could go back and change one thing, what would it be? And I thought about this for a long time before I finally had to say nothing. Because at the end of the day, it all worked out. And as much as I think doing all these things better would have made the development you know, faster, smoother, it is hard to argue with the results. And it would be unimaginable to think that it could have gone better than it did. But if you ask me what will we do different going forward, then the answer is everything, almost. Thank you, and no matter what you're working on, good luck. Uh, questions? Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, did you see the same problem uh, in your experience at uh, day by day, 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 daylight? Sorry. Uh, so dead by daylight. When I joined that team, that game had been out for four years, so they had already solved a lot of the the problems. Um, a lot of things that I talk about here, I stole from Dead by Daylight. Honestly, uh, so. Things like the branching system, uh, that was the same system that we used on Dead by Daylight. So, you know, as much as I think the modular approach would be better, the branching system was one that I was familiar with, I'd seen in practice. 
So yeah, I, I think it's very common for live service games to deal with a lot of these same problems. Um, and depending on where you are, you will probably have seen them solved differently. But that's why I stress, you know, these are easier to solve the earlier you think about them. So if you are making a live service game, you know, make sure you are asking yourself these questions and coming up with answers. Le learn from our mistakes. Don't do it yourself. True. Hello. Uh, Where am I looking? Over here. Hello. Hello. Uh, in, in such a regular and, and fast um, schedule of releases, and m most of them being quite hefty, I was wondering, uh, could you describe how you went around making the patch notes? So yeah, we have a, a system for the patch notes. It's kind of, um, I guess, a three-part process. First of all, we make sure we have uh, tickets tagged with the appropriate release in JIRA. So we have that record of what has been cl completed for a given release. Uh, we also have developers add uh, both the ticket and a, a patch notes tag to their changes when they submit them uh, to GitLab. We're on a Git system, but you can do the same thing no matter what your source control is. And finally, we have a script that goes through and collects all that information. It runs a, a diff between the two release branches, the current release branch and the previous one, and reports all the changes that have gone in, links to all the tickets, uh, and also uh, gives the, I mean, the full change summary, but also the patch notes prepared one that each developer has written. So that gives us a nice short list of patch notes that community can then look at and uh, compile. Thank you. Hello, I'm on your left. On my left. Hello. Yeah. So um, thank you for the conference. Uh, I'm an indie developer, and I'm making small multiplayer games. And usually, the player count is going to be like mid 10 player tops or 15 or something. And sometimes I'm wondering if it were to break in hundreds of, or something like that, how would I test in advance? You talk of load testing, for instance. How do you do load testing? Is there a way to, like, I don't know, a service, a good practice, something to do this in advance? Um, I don't, unfortunately, have a good answer for you on that one. Uh, I sort of watched it from arm's length, was not uh, down. Like, I knew it was happening. I knew the numbers we were hitting. Uh, but I don't, unfortunately, know the details. Um, I also don't know if there's something, I, like, I know we had help from Sony on that. So we had an engineering team that was stress testing hey, stuff. Your publisher did the load testing? For the uh, they helped, yeah. Like, we were involved with it. But uh, we, we did have outside help on that. So yeah, it, it's, it's, I'm not aware of any like, off-the-shelf indie solution, unfortunately. Um, yeah, sorry. Wish I could help you more with it. All right, thank you. Um, hello. Here. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, in a live service game such as yours, where the, the infrastructure that you build basically allows you to make the game live forever, and I wish that for you. Uh, Thank you. How forward are you looking as for content and release? Uh, what are exactly your plan with no sunset inside? Yeah, I mean, we have definitely we are trying to be very forward looking. Um, this was something I wish we'd actually done more before release. You know, we were very nervous. I wish we had had a more concrete, like, years-long vision. I think we had about a year planned when we initially launched. Um, at this point, we are building out a plan over several years uh, in the hopes that we can maintain it long term. Um, you do need a certain amount of flexibility in that. So we have, like, a super concrete plan for the next three months, a pretty solid plan for the next six months, and the further out you get, the fuzzier things are. Uh, so that's kind of, that's how we've been approaching it. Thank you. Uh, hello. On your right in front of you, here. Hello. hello. Well, thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you. My question being, um, how do you think you will use automated tests on smaller teams? Because I think at the same time, it's, use, it's useful because on smaller teams, if you can have less people spending time testing, it's a good thing. Yeah. But at the same time, it takes time to, and resources in a small team to um, keep all that automated stuff up to date. So how would you well, handle, basically, uh, automated tests on smaller teams? Uh, it's hard. It's harder the smaller the team is, definitely. Uh, I think you have to take a really 
targeted approach. Look at like what are the systems, uh, things you have the most of, things that you are likely to be touching the most. So again, in our example, um, like we have a lot of weapons, we have a lot of stratagems. Those are things that we are building on and adding to all the time. And that is sort of like the highest value, in my opinion, the highest value thing, because there's the most chance of us touching some underlying system that breaks something that we're not going to have time to test. So it's really just looking at like, yeah, what are the systems you're touching the most, you're changing the most, and the things that are going to be the hardest for you to test. Um, get, get a computer to do it in bulk. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. On your left. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I wanted to know, will the whole uh, succession of uh, missions and major orders and updates, like, uh, without any downtime for the players, how, were you, how, how are you managing the whole succession of missions? Do you like, plan for a lot of missions to go one after the other, thinking how the, the players are going to behave within it, each and every one of them? Or is it really just live decision by the famous Joel and um, like live update considering what the players do? Yeah, we, we definitely have a plan. We are not just flying by the seat of our pants. You know, sometimes we have issues where if, for example, a major order we discover isn't working correctly, we have to sub something in, figure out uh, an alternative way of, you know, some way of filling that gap. But uh, there is a... I'm not sure how long a plan they have, but the narrative team has a lot of stuff uh, ready to go. You know, that, of course, has been impacted by the, like, the content delays I talked about. We've had to adjust that schedule. Um, we're also trying to build it. You know, when we first launched, we were overly optimistic. We thought, OK, this is all going to go perfectly. We have one plan, and it's fine. Uh, now we have a lot of backups. So if something goes wrong with part of the narrative, with some of the missions, um, we have stuff, we have options, basically. We can sub something in. So, yeah, it works like our narrative structure works a lot like our general planning structure where, you know, have a plan, be ready, but have contingencies as well. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, uh, Hello. just in front of you. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, because, like, it's really cool for the talk, uh, thanks, I feel. Like, we all experience that kind of things with live series game in the end. Um, I was wondering about uh, your methods of uh, deciding on what features uh, you will be able to push in the end. Or what, what Do you have a process of, like, checking the ROI and what's your role uh, for this? Um, we, we don't have anything on, like, for an ROI. Um, or at least uh, that may be happening at a higher level than I'm working. Um, yeah, in terms of figuring out the features, like figuring out if something is ready to go out the door, we have a process where you know, we have stages of development. Um, Rami Ismail had, wrote a great thing about uh, gates or doors. I can't remember which one he called it specifically. Um, I, I wish I had the link for that, but if you look up Rami Ismail of Gates Doors, you'll probably find it, uh, describing where you, know, you go through a process, you go through the prototype phase, and make sure uh, everyone is in agreement that's good, then you move on to the next phase of development, make sure that's good, um, and so on, until a feature is either complete or canceled. You, you, know, you can move backwards, but um, you have to you know, be really thoughtful of consideration. It, it should be hard to kind of uh, roll things back. But it's also, you know, if something's not ready, it just doesn't clear that gate, it doesn't move on to the next phase of development until it is. Ho hopefully that's a, an okay answer to that one. Hello. I'm here on your left. Hello. Um, yeah, I wanted to know about that bus factor. Um, did you have any, did you encounter any friction when introducing it to the teams as some people might feel valued uh, because they are unique and because they are irreplaceable. Uh, so by asking them to share that knowledge that you are taking away from them that feeling of being irreplaceable. I, so I don't did think... Did you encounter any friction about that? No, we didn't have any friction with that. Um, we did have some friction with like uh, some of the solutions that we implemented. So like adding code reviews. Uh, there was some friction in the team uh, around that. Although it was something that people like very quickly came to understand the benefit of it um, 
for those reasons. So yeah, we were lucky. Uh, we didn't really have any, any people pushing back, trying to maintain their fiefdoms or anything like that. Cool. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Did we do it? Well, thank you once again for your valuable perspective. Thank you all for your attention. If you have any additional questions to address, please do so on the Discord, the GameCam Discord server, and in the auditorium channel, where Ian will do his best to answer your question. Uh, once again, thank you all for your attention, and have a good day.